Thank you so much. Um, Dobry večer. Thank you very much for having me. Good evening. Um, I'm sorry I'm going to speak in English. Um, I have managed to learn Czech in the two days that I've been here. Um, but I'm very grateful to Daniel for doing the translation um, so that you can hear me and understand me. I'm also very grateful to be here in Brno, in the university. Um, it's an amazing room to be surrounded by all of these figures from Hegel to Bourdieu. And I hope that I will be able to do something, at least, to, to do justice to their presence. Um, I'm talking about TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. I've spent the last 20 years of my life following European trade policy. So for me, it's very exciting that now suddenly everybody is interested in this field and we have a room full of people who want to know what TTIP is about. But I just wanted to start by asking you what level of knowledge you have already about TTIP. So if, for example, you know everything about TTIP, I want you to go like this. <laughs> so I'm hoping that Jan and others might do that. If you know a little bit, if you know, if you know not very much of that, if you know just a little bit, put your hand like that. So where are you? Are you good? Okay. So there's a difference, and some people know quite a lot, but maybe some people don't know so much. So I'm going to start um, at the beginning, really trying to say what is at stake with TTIP. Why is TTIP important to us? Why should we care about this trade deal, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is being negotiated miles away from us, not by the Czech government, not by the British government, not by the French government or the German government, but by the European Commission. And I think this is the first thing for us to understand. This is not a national trade deal. This is a transnational trade deal, negotiated by transnational agents. And part of the problem for us, as citizens of the European Union, is that we have no contact with what's in TTIP. At the beginning of the negotiations, they put a 30-year public ban on access to the key documents, which is good for your grandchildren, but not very good for democratic control now. And as a result of the pressure we've put on, we've been able to find out some of the things which are in it. So I'm going to start by, with where it came from. The negotiations started in 2013. In fact, President Barack Obama, in his State of the Union address in February 2013, he said we were going to negotiate TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. But that was not the genesis of TTIP. For the genesis, the origin of TTIP, you need to go further back. And in 1995, the chief executives of the top businesses of Europe and the USA came together and they formed the Transatlantic Business Dialogue. And the Transatlantic Business Dialogue was set up in order to represent the interests of the biggest businesses on both sides of the Atlantic. And they said, we want to create a single market across the Atlantic where we can trade and operate and invest free from the restrictions and the rules and the regulations which prevent us from maximizing our profits. So you need to remember, that's where it started. It was a business agenda. It started in 1995. And they tried to get this business agenda through the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, which was another deal which was in the 1990s. It was a big international campaign against it, and it was defeated. They tried again through the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Massive international campaign, it was defeated. So this, TTIP, is the third time they've tried to do this business of business, the idea of getting more power for the transnational corporations to trade and invest. We've beaten them twice, and they've come back for a third time, which is why we will beat them again. <laughs> In 2011, they started the preparatory work. What does that mean, to start the preparatory work? The European Commission held 119 secret meetings with business, asking them, what do you want in TTIP? It was your idea, what do you want in it? 
And so they told them, we want this, 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 this. And this is important for us to remember. They never asked us, civil society. They never asked the trade unions. They never asked academics even. They just went to the big business community, the biggest traders, the biggest producers, and asked them what they wanted. So, you may think that's a good thing, or you may think that's a bad thing, but that's just the fact of where it came from. Originally, they wanted to finish the negotiations this year, by the end of this year. But they've realized that they can't do that anymore, so they've shifted the time frame. I'll tell you at the end when they're trying to, to still finish it. But this is important as well, because they are not succeeding in what they tried to do. So they are having real problems in taking the negotiations through. And I'm going to come on and tell you what's inside TTIP. What I'm going to tell you is, and if you do one more, if you do it once more, I oh, know, keep, keep going. You'll see that this is the document which has been translated now into 12 European languages, which has more of the details in it. And the good news is that as of yesterday, this is also available in Czech. So I'm very grateful to Jan and all of his comrades in making that possible. I mention this because a lot of what I say is quite technical, and you may ask yourselves, where is the proof of what he's saying? And in the documents, I've been very careful to give all of the primary source references. So that if you don't believe me, you can read it when you go to the original documents later. Okay. So, there are three main pillars of TTIP when we're talking about the content in TTIP. There are three main pillars. And I'll go through each one of these in turn. The first is deregulation. The second is privatization. And the third are these new corporate courts which I will tell you about. So the first pillar is deregulation. And this is the central pillar of TTIP. If you think back to the old trade agreements of the Second World War period and after, they were about trade in goods, so things that you can actually trade, and they were about removing the tariff barriers, the taxes that these goods face at the border. So for example, let's say, I am the government of Brazil, and you are the delegation of the European Union, which is usually how it works. The European Union usually outnumbers the other countries. And I want to get more access to my coffee into Europe, but you have a 20% tariff barrier on my coffee. You want to get more European cars into Brazil, but I have a 20% tariff on cars coming into Brazil. So the old negotiations were a negotiation about tariffs. Okay, you drop your tariff from 20% to 2%, and I'll drop my tariff from 20% to 2%. My coffee gets to Europe easier, your cars come into Brazil easier. TTIP is not about that. Because the tariff barriers between the USA and the European Union are already very, very low. The tariff barriers are almost zero, except for one or two lines. So what they said right from the beginning explicitly is that TTIP was not about the border barriers. It was about reaching behind the border and getting rid of the regulations, the standards, the rules which operate in our society. Because for them, for the big business firms, these rules, these standards, are a block on their maximization of profits. In the United States, for example, I didn't know this. In the USA, there is no right to holiday pay. If you work in an office, you don't have a right to holiday pay. By law. Maternity pay, if you fall pregnant, forget it. Absolutely no. Whereas in Europe, these are rights which we've fought for over a long period of time and which are very important. Similarly, in terms of regulations in Europe, we have one central principle which is very important for all of our public health, our environmental, our food safety regulations. And that is the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle is important in Europe. It says that a business, if a business wants to introduce a new substance or a new process, the business has to prove it's 100% safe. If the business can't prove it's safe, then business cannot introduce it into commercial usage. 
which is good. It's called the precautionary principle. In the USA, it's 100% the other way around. If the government cannot prove it's unsafe, then business can introduce it. And this means that we have a huge difference in the types of regulations that we have. Take, for example, in food. In the USA, 90% of all beef is produced using growth hormones. So the cows are fed hormones, which means they grow quicker, they can be killed earlier, they become more profitable. The problem? In Europe, the scientists have found that these hormones cause cancer in humans. And so they've been banned for 20 years in Europe. The USA says that's a trade barrier. You can't just suddenly put a ban up on our beef. We eat it, you need to eat it. Genetically modified foods. 70% of all processed food in the US supermarkets contains genetically modified ingredients, GM ingredients. In Europe, we simply don't want them to be in our food. The US says, no, under TTIP, you need to introduce that. Raptopamine, another hormone used for pork, banned in Europe, fine in the USA, and they're saying we need you to get rid of those rules as well. But one rule which I think is very interesting, if you go to the next one, is in the European Union, when it comes to cosmetics, we have high standards on cosmetics. If you press there. And again, we have a list in Europe. And the list goes to page after page. These are substances which are banned for use in cosmetics. 1,377. Yeah, you think that's a good thing. You put cosmetics on your face. It's important to have public health protection. In the USA, the same list is just... You do the right spot? 11. And that means that the difference in protection in public health is because of the difference in regulations. And this you can see in so many areas. Environment, social standards, labour standards, public health, food safety. And in fact, what's interesting for me, because the next one, in the USA, it's still possible to buy lipstick with lead in it. Lead, which we know to be a toxin, which is banned in petrol. But they in the USA can put it on their lips. On their lips. And the US government says, yeah, we do allow lead in lipstick. But it's in small quantities. And if you apply it correctly, it should not be damaging to your health. And this is the type of difference that we're seeing. Also, you have a lot in terms of food. I believe that Jamie Oliver is famous in the Czech Republic. Jamie Oliver's office is next to my office in London. So, <laughs> so a small claim to make. And so we have had lots of meetings about this because he has tried in his cookery, in his, in his, in his work as a chef, to introduce the idea of high quality food and high quality food education. So people know what they eat. And for him, he's now come out, he said he's very, very worried because in terms of food, TTIP will mean a race to the bottom. So you get the picture. Deregulation is at the heart of TTIP. And for us in Europe, it's one of the most worrying aspects. Okay, the second pillar is privatization. And not just privatization, but irreversible privatization. Already in Europe, we have privatization. In my country, everything is privatized. Just the air, the oxygen is the only thing left now. The water's gone, the post, the rail, the health service, the education, everything has been sold off. But we dream that maybe we can get a new government in the future which will bring it back into public hands. We know it's very popular in Britain to re-nationalize the railways to take the, the, the public health back into public hands. But if you put a privatized service into a trade deal, you can't take it back. The whole logic of a trade deal is that you're saying to a foreign company, this market is open and it will stay open. You will get guaranteed access to the market in the future. That's the point of trade deals. And we are very worried about this because we know from a leak, which came out in February of this year, is 
the BBC, they leaked a document out of TTIP which shows you all of the sectors that are now being offered up by the European Union inside TTIP. And sure enough, you can read it. There's health, education, water, road, rail, post, financial services. All of these services are included within TTIP. There is only one service which is not included within TTIP, and that is the audiovisual services. And you think, why? It's because the French don't want Hollywood to attack their television and cinema industry. The French, at the beginning of the negotiations, said, we will not allow audiovisual services to go in TTIP. And the Germans were angry with them, the British were angry with them, and the European Commission was angry with them, and the French said, no. For us, we will not allow TTIP to start if it includes audiovisual. But everything else is inside that. And we, we now know we don't even need to look at the leak. leak because now we have, in black and white, this is now a published document by the European Commission, and you can read for yourself. All of our public services are inside TTIP, and the fear of privatization is a real fear. But it's not just the US corporations trying to get into the markets of public services in Europe, because TTIP isn't really about the nasty old USA versus the nice old European Union. It's about business, as we started with, big business on both sides of the Atlantic trying to open up markets for themselves. And that's why, if you go to the next one, one of the key targets for the European big business is to open up the local government contracts in the USA. In the USA, at the state level or at the county level, they have many of these provisions which for government contracts, they can only be given to small firms, local firms, family firms to protect local jobs. It's called buy local or buy American. It's a good thing. It tries to preserve local economies. It tries to preserve local jobs and not have people all have to rush off to get really bad jobs in, country, in parts of the country where they don't live. This is the number one target for European business. It's a market which they estimate to be worth $650 billion a year, and it's a market that they're not allowed into. So don't ever let them tell you that the TTIP is about the European Union against the USA. It's about business on both sides trying to improve their opportunities but at the expense of everybody else. So that's pillar one, deregulation. Pillar two, privatization. And pillar three is the most outrageous, the most incredible. It is this new system for the European Union versus the USA of corporate courts. It's called the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, ISDS. And this means that the investor foreign corporation is now raised to the level of the nation state. This means that for the first time for the whole of Europe, US corporations have the right to sue our governments in their own private tribunals, not open to us, not open to domestic companies, not even open to governments, just open to the big corporations of the USA. They can sue you for any new law or regulation which you bring in which could hurt their profits in the future. And this is extraordinary for us. It's less extraordinary for the Czech Republic, we'll come on to that in a moment, because you already have a little bit of experience of this. But for us it's extraordinary, and the best way of understanding what it means, and the, the threat to democracy, is to look at some of the examples. So we have the first example which maybe you do already know about. And that is an example in Germany. Do you remember in 2011, Japan had the big tsunami, which killed 20,000 people and caused the Fukushima nuclear reactor to blow up? Do you remember this? As a result, in Germany, hundreds of thousands of people went on the streets to protest against nuclear power. And the German government said, OK, we will phase out nuclear power over 10 years. 
So by the year 2022, there will be no more nuclear power in Germany. And you think, well, that's good. They're, transmitting, they're transferring to renewable power. This is a good thing. Vattenfall is a Swedish company. And using another treaty, called the Energy Charter Treaty, as is suing the German government for 5 billion euros. Because they say, you don't have the right. What's that, 120 billion crowns, more or less? You don't have the right to choose because we have expectations, this word expectations, of the profits that we're going to make in the future. And you've closed down the market. You can't do that under the rules. And what's worrying about this is that Vattenfall has already succeeded. You see, this is Mark 2. Mark 1, the first case of Vattenfall, is because the city of Hamburg demanded that Vattenfall meet some high environmental conditions for another power plant on the river Elbe outside Hamburg. And Vattenfall says, we don't want to meet these conditions. We want to make the investments with lower conditions on environment so they sued the German government, not the city of Hamburg. So if Bono introduces something, you don't sue Bono, you sue the Czech Republic. And they made a deal. Without asking, they made a deal which said, OK, we will relax the rules. This time, Vattenfall does not have to abide by the environmental conditions. So Vattenfall said, thank you very much. So this is the second time they're coming back. Another very famous case is Philip Morris versus Australia. Again, you may know that in Australia, at the end of 2012, they introduced a new law so that all cigarettes could be, must now only be sold in plain brown packaging. So there's no more Marlboro, there's no more Camel, there's no more Lucky Strike. These things are all gone. Instead, you have brown paper with a big health warning. Philip Morris is suing the Australian government for billions of dollars because they say that this is an infringement of their right to make profits in the future. It's an infringement of their intellectual property because they want to have more growth in the face of the Australian people and you don't have the right as a government to choose to cut that exposure. And I think this is an important case because sometimes if you say, if you criticise this to your government, to your members of parliament, they'll say, no, 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 there's nothing to worry about. This is about giving power to corporations to be able to hold their contracts. Let's say I'm a British or a US um, corporation, I have a, a contract with the city of Burnham to provide environmental services. And let's say the city of Burnham cancels my contract. Well, I have a right under the contract to take you to court. And I have a right to claim back compensation. This is not about contracts. Philip Morris never had a contract to sell cigarettes to the Australian people. This is about your legitimate expectations of making profits into the future. Not now, not compensation for what you've lost, but for future estimated profits. And that's why this is so incredible. The next case is closer to home. Next door, next door in Slovakia. Acmea is a Dutch company, and they sued the government of Slovakia because the government of Slovakia reversed a very unpopular privatization of health. So the new government which came in in 2006 in Slovakia said we will reverse the health privatization as a health insurance system. And they did. They came in, they were elected, and they reversed the privatization. Akmea sued the government of Slovakia, even though it was democratically elected, and they won. They would pay 22 million euros in compensation and 3 million euros in costs. The government of Slovakia said, we're not paying. We were democratically elected. We are a sovereign, democratic country. We don't have to pay you just because you can't make the same profits from the privatized service. So what did they do? Akmea got a court in Luxembourg to seize 30 million euros of the assets of the people of Slovakia just so they could pay the company. And this gives you a sense of the problems with democracy. Now, one interesting other fact. You may look at the countries of the world which have suffered most, and you will see which is number three. 
after Argentina, after Venezuela, the Czech Republic has suffered more cases than any other country in the world under this system. Because the Czech Republic already has a lot of these bilateral investment treaties with other countries. And so, in a sense, you are in a situation where you have experienced this already. And so it's worth looking at the Czech Republic's record on this already. So, as I say, the Czech Republic is facing most cases of any country in Europe under these investor state challenges. Not because of TTIP, because TTIP hasn't come in yet, but because of the bilateral country-to-country -country cases. We reckon it's, a, it's had to pay out over 13 billion crowns, more or less. So around 500 million euros. But we never know, because many of these cases are kept completely secret. In the UK, we've had two cases only. And we, the government, when we asked them about it, refused to tell us anything. Completely secret. The Czech Republic already has a bilateral investment treaty, a bit, a bilateral investment treaty with the USA, which has been in place in place since 1991. Nine of the 28 member states of the EU have this, and 19 don't. And one of the interesting cases, again, to show you how absurd these cases can be, is relevant to TV Nova. I've asked, for me, I don't know what TV Nova is, but I understand everybody here knows TV Nova. TV Nova was, was basically challenged because this American guy, Mr. Lauder, in the 1990s, invested a whole lot of money into TV Nova, both in his own name and through his company, CME. The two investments were made. And then, he said, there's been interference because the Czech Media Council has interfered in the running of this business, and I'm now going to sue the Czech government for damages. He sued them twice, once as Mr. Lauder, through the US-Czech Republic Bilateral Investment Treaty. He also sued, under the name of CME, through the Netherlands-Czech Republic Bilateral Investment Treaty. The US case was heard in London. The Netherlands case was heard in Stockholm. They were saying it was the same case, with the same rules. And the London one says, no, he has not got a case to stand on. The Czech Republic is right. Stockholm said, the Czech Republic is wrong. So you have to pay him 250 million euros. And people are now calling this ultimate fiasco. It shows how crazy this whole system is. That you can have two groups of people who will come up to completely different results. And this is because they're not real courts. They're not judges. The people who make these decisions are corporate lawyers. They're lawyers who have represented the same companies in other cases in the past. And what happens is, when you have one of these tribunals, the company, now that, will choose the first lawyer. The country, Czech Republic, will choose the second lawyer. And these two individuals together choose the third lawyer. And that is your court. And these are corporate lawyers who benefit when they find in favour of corporations. And this is why there is so much anger about this across Europe. Last year, the European Commission held a public consultation on this ISDS. Usually when the European Commission holds a public consultation, it will get what? 30, 40, 50 responses, maybe 100 responses. On a really good day, it will get 200 responses. For this, it got 150,000 responses from across Europe. And almost all of them, except for the business lobby, said, no, we do not want anything to do with this. Not only do we want to stop it in TTIP, we also want to rip up the ones which already exist, like between the Czech Republic and the USA. But what was the response? This woman is the Trade Commissioner of the European Union, Cecilia Malmström. She's from Sweden. And she, I met with her privately in a personal meeting in her office in Brussels this year. And I said to her, you know that the people of Europe so angry about this. You know that 150,000 people took the trouble to write back to your consultation and they all said no. And yet now you still want it. And she said to me, I don't take my mandate from the European people. <laughs> she takes it directly from business. So instead of saying no, she has renamed 
the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, ICS, the Investment Court System. And so she's saying, no, it's okay, because we'll have a court which looks a bit more like a proper court, not these kangaroo courts, as we call them in English, which are just nothing to do with real justice. But the principle is still there, and now it will be enshrined in a permanent court. So this is one of the key issues. Okay, I want to just do two more aspects of TTIP, and then I want to finish with some politics at the end, because it's good to have politics at the end of one of these talks. The first is about employment costs. When they first started telling us about TTIP, they said, TTIP's going to be great. It's going to lead to jobs in Europe, jobs in the USA, and every family in Europe will be richer by 545 euros each. We said to them, come on, nobody believes that type of statistic. And they said, actually, even we don't believe it. <laughs> but we're going to keep it out anyway. And then we looked deeper. We looked deeper into their statistics. And their statistics, not our statistics, the official assessment shows at least one million jobs will be lost as a result of TTIP. 680,000 in Europe and 325,000 in the USA. That's a minimum. If they get the ambitious TTIP that they want, it will lead to the loss of two million jobs. And we've put a paper out first, which we put out last year, which has all the details of that, but also in the new document it has all the details of the calculation of where that's made. Okay, you think, okay, a million people might lose their jobs. Maybe they'll get few jobs. How? In many countries of Europe, you have unemployment levels, record levels. In places like Greece and Spain, youth unemployment is over 50%. In the Czech Republic, I believe, it's over 20% for youth unemployment. People are not going to get new jobs. And the European Commission has admitted there are legitimate concerns, this is their language, that job losses from TTIP will be prolonged and substantial. They will not be overnight changes. These are big structural changes to the economies of Europe. And particularly, we're thinking of sectors like agriculture, where the European farmers cannot compete with the big US agribusiness. But also, we're thinking of many other sectors, maybe even the car industries, which have promised lots of new jobs. Maybe they actually won't get new jobs because they will be hit by competition from the US. So remember this, when your politicians tell you TTIP will be good for you, ask them about the official estimate of one million jobs minimum to go. The second issue is the environment. And this is important as well because inside TTIP there is a special chapter, they think it's going to be a standalone chapter, which deals with the export of oil and gas from the USA to Europe. Oil and gas from the USA to Europe, at the moment, there are restrictions on the export of oil and gas. But, under TTIP, they're hoping to introduce a special chapter which will have the, which will open up gas and oil exports from the US to the European Union. And this is particularly problematic because the, the oil is going to come from the Canadian tar sands, which is the dirtiest oil that exists. 40% more carbon dioxide emissions than normal oil. And this is at a time when we are meant to be, when we are meant to be cancelling our dependency on fossil fuels. As Europe, we're meant to be taking a lead in terms of the new climate change talks, for example, which will come up next year. Europe is meant to be taking a lead in terms of the climate change talks in Paris in December. Europe says we are a global leader when it comes to climate change action. But instead, the European Commission has admitted TTIP will lead to the extra, extra generation of millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that is only one of their predictions. They also predict that it will lead to other problems. But why then, sorry, it's not a great picture, why do they feel that this is worth it? Because for them, if you can get US gas and US oil in huge quantities, much cheaper, 
This will break the dependency of European nations on Russian oil and Russian gas. And that's why they call TTIP the economic NATO, because it will strengthen the NATO transatlantic alliance against Russia. They say this totally openly. In the same way as TTIP is trying to build the European Union and the US alliance against China, against Brazil, against India, against all of the other emerging nations. Particularly, they want it to be against Russia, so that they can isolate Putin, they can isolate his descendants, and they can secure an alliance which will help militarily and economically against him. Now, I know that this is different. You're, you're much closer to Putin than we are in Britain. We're in the far west islands on the edge of, 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 the, of the Atlantic. And I know that in countries like Poland, for example, they are really worried about this because they are having NATO troops moving up and down the east of the country in Poland in order to rattle the sabers, to bang the drum of war against Russia. But we don't think this is a very clever example of how to do political geostrategic relations. And that's why my final bit is the politics. The political reactions in Europe and the USA. Okay, when TTIP is finished, if they manage to finish the negotiations, how will it get ratified? How does it come into law? Firstly, it goes to the European Council, which is the top governance body of the member states. And the European Council at the moment is 28 member states, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Britain, France, etc., etc., etc. Not many of our governments are going to say no to TTIP. Maybe there are one or two in Greece, Syriza, have said they will make it their present, their gift to the people of Europe to vote down TTIP, which is nice. In Spain, they've got Podemos and the possibility of a left-left government, which again could be anti-TTIP. In Ireland, maybe you don't know so much about the Irish situation, they have elections next year, and Sinn Féin is a Republican party in Ireland, which also has said it's against TTIP. So who knows? Even at that level of the council, they might not succeed. I don't think the UK government will say no. I don't think the Czech government at the moment will say no. But these governments could say no. Okay. The next time, it gives the European Parliament. And the European Parliament is interesting because they have to say yes. They're not allowed to change anything in TTIP. In fact, most of them aren't even allowed to see it until it's too late. But they are allowed to say yes or no. And this is an interesting calculation for us. We're now making the calculation. You've got the left parties and the green parties, which is about 100 of the total. Total is 751. The green parties and the left parties are 100. Then you have the far right parties, who are not our friends, but they will vote against TTIP for their own reasons. And they are about 100. So that's about 200 who will vote against TTIP in all circumstances. The Conservatives, the Christian Democrats, the Liberal parties, even, I think, maybe Anno, because Anno sits within the Liberal bloc, within the European Union, within the Aldi, they will probably vote for TTIP every day. So the question then is, what about the Social Democrats, the Social Democratic parties? These become the most important ones in order to have the swing vote, the vote which makes the difference. And they are a problem for us because they should be voting with us and saying, no, this is a crazy deal. But unfortunately, they have decided it's better to vote for business. And if you see in July of this year, they had a vote at the European Parliament. Not the final vote, because the final vote is still many years in the distance. This guy is called Bernd Langer. He's a German social democrat who is in charge of the trade committee of the European Parliament. And he and his friend Martin Schulz, another German social democrat, who is in charge of the whole European Parliament, they did a dirty deal, a nasty, dirty deal with the Conservatives, which said, we don't care about the people of Europe, we will vote pro TTIP. And this was interesting, because his group, the social democratic group, split. And the French said no. And the British, because we put a lot of pressure on them, said no. But the Germans and the Italians, who are the strong social democratic parties, said we are going to vote with the Conservatives 
yes to TTIP. I'm sorry to say that the Czech Social Democrats, of which there are four MEPs, three of them went German, and only one of them came with us and voted no, Jan Keller. So we have a little bit more hope there. But it shows that at the European level, we are really fighting this because we can still make it work. Then it has to come to national parliaments. Every national parliament in the European Union gets a vote, yes or no, on this. So the Czech parliament will get a vote on this some years in the distance. The UK government will get a vote. In Belgium, parliament, sorry, the Belgian have six parliaments. The French speaking, the German speaking, the Flemish speaking, the Parliament of Brussels, the Parliament of this bit, the Parliament of that bit. Six times they have to vote yes. If one of them votes no, that could be a problem. And if you keep seeing in Britain there have been problems, in France also there have been problems in terms of, of what they've said. So you can just see more and more national parliaments where you are getting these type of debates, they're realising it's a problem. But then, we can't leave it to our politicians, and this is the good news about this. We, the people, have also taken action against TTIP. And we launched last year what's called the European Citizens' Initiative. I don't know if people know about this. The European Citizens' Initiative? Some people nodding, not many. Basically, this is our number one, our only channel, in order to have a democratic right to tell the European Commission what we want. And in the space of one year, over three million people have signed the European Citizens Initiative across Europe. The biggest ever initiative in the history of all of these things. And in national countries, country after country, where it's blue, this means we met the national quota. Each country has a quota of signatures. And I'm very glad to say that one of the countries was the Czech Republic, <laughs> which also met the quota of signatures for this. And I think it's very appropriate. This was the group in Germany sent out these congratulations groups. And I think it was appropriate they put Franz Kafka on because, you know, this TTIP is something that Franz Kafka could have thought up in his imagination. Okay, so enough of that. I want to just finish by talking about the USA. So the last little bit I want to talk about is how is the USA looking? In the USA, there is a movement against TTIP, but also they have the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So President Obama is not just looking east towards Europe, he's looking west towards Asia and the countries of Latin America as well. And they concluded those talks just last month. This is very new. They then held the 11th round of TTIP negotiations in Miami, again, at the end of last month. So this is the newest information. This is happening right now. And they've said, as a result of the progress, yep, They've missed the deadline of 2015, but they want to declare the, the, the TTIP negotiations to be concluded by the end of next year. So that means, for us, that this year, coming up, is the most important time. We need to try to build people's awareness and build a movement against TTIP in every single one of the 28 member states of Europe, including the Czech Republic, including Slovakia, including Hungary, including all of the ones which we have neighbours in and friends in, to say no. And interestingly, we have an, a first try, a dry run, a, a practice, if you want, with the EU-Canada deal, CETA. We call it CETA's big brother, because it started negotiations in 2009, and the negotiations concluded in September of last year. T CETA is now being prepared for the ratification process. And we think it will probably come in the second half of 2016. It gives you an idea of how secret these things are. Nobody will tell us when this is going to happen. But we know somebody who has a friend, who has a friend who works in the European Commission Translation Department. <laughs> and the friend said, we haven't seen the CETA text. We haven't started translating it yet. So we think, aha. Because it will take them at least six months to translate it, because they have to translate it into all the official languages of the European Union, including in Czech. They will then send it to the member states, they'll send it to Prague, to the government, and say, what do you think of the translation? That will take them another two or three months. And then they can start ratifying. Why do we care about the EU-Canada deal? We're not scared of Canadian companies. 
In fact, does anybody know a Canadian company? I think, you know, nobody can really think of Canadian companies being vicious or aggressive, but 80% of all US companies that are active in the European Union have got their own offices in Canada. And so they can use CETA to sue our governments because CETA includes these state powers. And that's why we are now really working hard to see if we can get a possible rejection of CETA at the European Parliament. So I know that that's a lot of information, and I know it's a lot of depressing information. The good news is that we can win against these treaties. We have won before in the past, again and again, and this time we have the biggest ever campaign across Europe. Even the Trade Commissioner says this is the biggest ever campaign she's seen on trade in Europe. With ordinary people like you, like me, like all of us, we can defeat this and we can tell the politicians we do not want to have a future which is just for the benefit of big business. We want to have a future which we can believe in, which has a social dimension, which has high environmental standards, and we believe it will be fair for all people. And that's why the good news is to leave you with the last, the last um, slide. This is one of the demonstrations they've had in Germany. In Berlin, just last month, they had 250,000 people on the streets saying no TTIP. 250,000. With that type of strength in every single one of these countries, all of our countries, then we can defeat it. So this is my invitation to you, is to get 250,000 people onto the streets of Berlin. Saying no to you in the next year. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you.